Welcome to the Cartoonist Kayfabe Courtroom. My name is Ed Piscor. I'm Jim Rugg. Uh, today we're going to be taking a look at the John Byrne testimony in the Marv Wolfman case against Marvel for the creative rights uh, as to the ownership of uh, Blade the Immortal, uh, Deacon Frost, a couple of those other like gimmick characters from the uh, Midnight Suns era. This is... Uh... This is testimony, not deposition. This is testimony in a court of law, so I think we will have a little cross-examination. Cool. Before we get into things, uh, I do want to uh, implore everybody to like, follow, and subscribe to the YouTube channel. Uh, hit the bell icon uh, on days where we're not doing a court, a courtroom testimony. The books that we're talking about uh, are sometimes out of print and on eBay and Amazon. They go quick. To The people who get first dibs or the people who hit the bell and are notified about the videos that we are discussing. And whenever uh, you watch these videos to completion, it pushes the video content out to um, other comic book loving uh, YouTube watchers who are not quite familiar with cartoonist kayfabe. So that's been growing our num numbers exponentially. And on Mondays, we like to do these uh, these courtroom dramas. Very often, they're some of the best interviews they really that, are. that you get with the creatives involved because they are uh, bound by law uh, for fear of perjury. Uh, this, is, to, this is their best version of comics history. To Even if it's not totally right, at least I assume they're trying. What's the popular uh, fr phrase of the day? Uh, it's their truth. Okay, <laughs> yes. They're speaking their truth. <laughs> uh, so what we're going to be talking about today, man, is the John Byrne testimony uh, in relation to the Marv Wolfman court case. We need to get another copy of this, man. Uh, somebody sent this to us with a big transcription of the Marv Wolfman uh, testimony. And issue. this is issue 236. And issue 239 has the wrap-up of this. People say it's very heartbreaking stuff. Mm. Uh, we do have the keys to the kingdom, but it would be nice to have paper copies for us to, to kind of go through. And this is a 2001 magazine, so I assume this court case, 1990, late 90s. Yeah, November 1999. Perfect. And uh, what the the sort of crux of Marv Wolfman's argument for um, what I've gleaned, just like looking through this kind of quickly, is that he did not explicitly sell the rights to Blade the Immortal and these other characters for the sum total of ten dollars per page page rate work for hire that he did with uh, with Marvel. It's also suggested that like work for hire means that they provide things for you to like do the creations on um which makes me think about like the marvel blue line paper like how we all wanted some of that as kids <laughs> and and that's a scam because they're pro <laughs> because they're providing you the materials to make their work for them it's so insidious if that were, were, were true <laughs> i mean it is like this deposit i mean this testimony with with marv wolfman like they ask him like you know do you use marvel stationery blah blah wow. blah so like that blue line like that's a scam that's scam paper dude Make your own templates, everybody. That's goddamn right, man. <laughs> so uh, in the testimony, Marv Wolfman is up there, and he's talking about stuff. And I think Jim Shooter was even... Like, Jim Shooter is a chatty Cathy, man. And he, he's, he's in court all the time with these guys. Uh, and, and he... Marv Wolfman says, you know, I think that Jim Shooter was telling his version of the truth. I don't agree with it, but I don't think he was lying. And then he mentions, like, John Byrne and, like, you know... John Byrne, he's over there, and he keeps making faces at me. He, like, says it on the stand, right? And eventually, John Byrne gets called up as, as a kind of a witness in, fa in favor of Marvel. Um, I do think we have some cross-examination here, but uh, to begin, there's direct examination of John Byrne by uh, Mr. David Fleischer. I'm not sure if that is, uh, if that is um, defense people, if that's Marvel people, or if that's Marvel Wolfman people. But we do want to thank Dan Best uh, for this part of the testimony because the John Byrne stuff is not in the comics ah, journal. Okay. Um, but Dan Best had it on, on his uh, his blog. And, and has authored some of these legal books, including one on Todd McFarlane and his court cases. So go support Dan Best if you enjoy these kinds of uh, comics history. Um, I do find this stuff to be eye-opening you totally. know it's definitely a different tone than what you get in a typical comics interview yes yes so uh i played todd mcfarlane on the last round of recordings uh i think we might be able to blast through this whole one uh here in one session uh, i'll be every voice that is not john byrne you play john byrne and uh we'll get the we'll get the show on the road man i will do my best will you do your damn best i should have grown a beard yes for, for this one but uh didn't plan well enough. Good to go? I am. 
All right, man. This is from Mr. David Fleischer. Cartoonist Kayfabe is Ed Piscor and Jim Rugg, two working cartoonists. The best way to support Cartoonist Kayfabe is to buy the books that we make. And here's what's available from Ed Piscor. WYSIWYG, Portrait of a Serial Hacker, is about the history of computer hacking. X-Men, Grand Design, the, uh, the, the beginning of the Grand Design franchise, starts with X-Men. This is a complete retelling of the history of X-Men. The first 30 years is one epic continuous story across three volumes or in one giant oversized volume if you can find that one uh seems like it's constantly out of print but a beautiful volume if you can find it hip-hop family tree this is a history of hip-hop as the title suggests four oversized volumes treasury sized editions telling the history of hip-hop through comics uh one of your most popular books ed your current book Red Room, the Antisocial Network, available now in print wherever books are sold. This is a collection of the first season of Red Room Comics, collecting four issues, beautifully reproduced with some great bonus material here in the back of the book. And starting in March, the next season, Red Room Trigger Warnings will be coming to comic book stores. This is the cover to look for. And due to some uh, issues at the distribution level, this may be the rarest of Red Room comics. So look for this one in March. And here are the covers to keep your eyes peeled for. That's your main cover. This is a variant by Ed Piscor, a variant by Peach Momoko, and a variant by yours truly. These will be in comic shops March 9th. The books of mine that are available right now, The Plain Janes, the first American young adult graphic novel, 500 pages of a bunch of high school girls who get together and start doing art around their community, a la Banksy, and get in all sorts of trouble from uh, teachers to the local police and, of course, parents and some of their fellow students. Uh, 500 pages perfect for the young adult reader or young artist in your life. Street Angel, Deadliest Girl Alive. This is my collection of Street Angel comics published by Image Comics. Eight complete full-color stories featuring the Deadliest Girl Alive, The Princess of Poverty, The Homeless Ninja on a Skateboard. And coming in March, Cartoonist Kayfabe Month, by the way, everyone, is my next project, Hulk Grand Design, with variant covers by Peach Momoko, Marcos Martin, Cartoonist Kayfabe's own Ed Piscor, and Hulk Grand Design Madness coming in April, covered by Jeff Darrow on that one. And you can see the main covers here in the background. This is a retelling of the history of the Incredible Hulk, 60, celebrating 60 years of Incredible Hulk history and comic books, 500 issues, 10,000 plus pages, distilled down into two oversized, action-packed issues, perfect for the longtime Hulk fan or the first-time comics reader. And now back to our regular scheduled programming. Your Honor, the first witness we are calling is John Byrne. Before Mr. Byrne is called to the stand, I would like to identify him, Mr. Byrne, was a freelance writer and artist uh, for Marvel Comics between 1974 and 1980 and has since done work for DC, Marvel, Dark Horse, and Charlton. He is currently a full-time employee of Marvel under an exclusive contract. Mr. Byrne will testify with respect to the legends that were affixed to all checks that he received for freelance work he did over the years, including in the mid-70s. He will also testify with respect to a number of conversations that he had with Marv Wolfman concerning Mr. Wolfman's understanding with regard to the ownership of rights in the works that Mr. Wolfman did for Marvel. Mr. Byrne, uh, you are currently employed by Marvel? Yes, I am. During the course of your career, have you created any characters? Yes, many. Can you give us an idea in order of magnitude? Ranging up from support cast members, I would say between 150 and 175. Prior to the time that you received your first freelance assignment from Marvel, uh, did there come a time when you wanted to work on Marvel's Fantastic Four series? There was a period in the mid-1970s up through 1974. Marvel was producing a series under the heading of Giant Size, so it was fill in the title, Giant Size Fantastic Four, Giant Size Hulk. Those were quarterlies. They were not the actual monthly series. I prepared on spec, I think it was a 38-page Fantastic Four story to show Marvel in the hopes that I would see that published as one of the giant size. Okay, from Conjecture, we have a video highlighting yes. uh, those comics. Um, it was Those pages were published in an, in an issue of uh, Comics Interview Magazine. Got a hold of it, did a whole video on that stuff, Ben, uh, in the magnifying glass in the top corner of our YouTube channel. Type in John Byrne, you'll, you'll, you'll find that Fantastic Four series. Real, really beautiful set of pages it's a great issue of comics interview <laughs> like highly recommended that, that that's a special one 
Uh, back to the game. After having created the giant size spec piece, what did you do with it? I attended a convention in the summer of 1974. I had just been given a six-page assignment for a short horror story from Marvel. On the basis of that, I was able to get into a prose-only cocktail party that Marvel threw, and I took that story with me to that party and showed it to anybody who would care to look at it. What ultimately happened with regard to that giant size spec piece you did? They didn't use it. Did you have an understanding of who was responsible for the decision not to use it? Well, the story I have been told from several different sources is that earlier in that same day, I had been introduced to Rick Buckler, who was the artist on The Fantastic Four. And in my usual endearing way, I had introduced myself to him by saying, Hi, I am John Byrne. I want your job. The fact that I was walking around with a fully finished issue of The Fantastic Four under my arm probably gave him some indication that I was serious. And I am told he went to either Roy Thomas or John Romita and said, If this guy gets work, I quit. So the decision was obviously based upon the guy they had versus the untried guy who was trying to get work. At your deposition, you testified, and then a Mr. Delberto uh, pops in. Objection. Move to strike as hearsay, Your Honor. He, has, he was recounting a statement that someone allegedly told him at a cocktail party. Mr. Fleischer, Your Honor, it wasn't really being offered for the truth of what was asserted there, but with respect to the witness's state of mind at the time. The court says, I will allow it, Mr. Fleischer. Do you recall testifying at your deposition that at the time of this convention, uh, Yeti uh, were, un probably you, were uncertain as to whether Mr. Wolfman was the editor-in-chief or not? I was probably not uncertain at the time of the convention, but I was uncertain at the time of the deposition. Has your recollection been refreshed to any extent as to whether or not Mr. Wolfman was the editor at the time of the convention? Yes, I was actually sort of blindsided by that question at the deposition because it had, in my opinion, nothing to do with this case. So I rather foolishly allowed Mr. Wolfman's counsel to present facts, quote unquote, which I did not question, suggesting that Mr. Wolfman was the editor-in-chief, and if he was indeed the editor-in-chief, it would have been his job to reject the story. Now looking back, I realize, of course, that since it took place in 1974, Marv Wolfman could not have been the editor-in-chief, and in fact, it would have been Roy Thomas. Do you ever believe that Mr. Wolfman was responsible for the rejection of that spec piece? No. Uh, did you ever harbor any resentment toward Mr. Wolfman as a result of not having that spec piece purchased by Marvel? No, even when I thought he had rejected it. At that convention, were you successful in getting any other work? Yes, I received work from Charlton Comics, regular work, which led to two series at Charlton Comics, and that generated sufficient interest that by early 1975 I was working full-time at Marvel. When did you receive your first f freelance assignment from Marvel apart from that brief one? Apart from the eight-pager, the actual assignment was probably late 1974 because I know I started work on it in January of 1975. It was to be the regular penciler on a series called Iron Fist. Have you ever heard the phrase work for hire used in the comic book industry? Yes, many times. When do you first recall hearing the term? I cannot actually say. I can't remember when I didn't hear it. I can remember hearing it before I got into the business. I mean, we were always being cautioned about it. How was that term used when you recall hearing it at the outset of your comic career? It was always presented to me as anything you do for the company, the company owns. Mr. Deliberto uh, pops in. Objection, Your Honor. Move to strike his hearsay. The court says overruled. Mr. Fleischer responds, uh, Mr. Byrne, were you paid by... Were you paid by check for the materials that you created for Marvel Comics as a freelancer? Yes, I was. Would you describe the check uh, that you received for the first assignment that you had uh, for Marvel in, I think it was 1974-75? Mr. Diliberto says, objection, uh, no foundation and lack of competence. The court says overruled. It was what I assumed to be a standard bank issue check. It had pay this guy and an amount of money on it. There was a stamp down in the corner of the signature. I think it was Stan Lee. I don't think it was decorated with a picture of Spider-Man in those days. Of course, on the back was the stamp, the legend that we all had to sign. Do you recall what color the legend was? I think it was red. Do you recall what the substance of the legend said? 
Pretty much, it said what I expected it to say. It confirmed what I had heard. It said everything you do for the company, the company owns. Do you recall whether or not you ever received a check from Marvel for freelance work done uh, for publication by Marvel that was not stamped with that legend? No, that would have stood out. I would have noticed. Did, did there come a time when the practice of legending the checks at Marvel was discontinued? I think they discontinued it when they started putting essentially the same legend on the back of the voucher. So by signing the voucher, you were signing the agreement. Would it be correct for me to say that you are well known in the comic book industry with your work with iconic tide titles, we'll say? Infamous, I think would be a good choice. <laughs> uh, would you give the court an example of some of the tides? Why are they saying tides? Uh that you have worked on at Marvel and at DC, indicating at which? At Marvel, I have worked on the Fantastic Four, the Hulk, Spider-Man, the Avengers, Iron Man, She-Hulk, West Coast Avengers. It's quite a long list. At DC, I have done Superman, Batman, Wonder Woman. Question. Uh, I have to interject here. Note the absence of X-Men yeah. in that list. Yeah, Keep glaring. <laughs> have you ever introduced into any of those tides... It really says Tides, uh, that you wrote for Marvel any characters that you created. Yes, many. Did any of those characters go on to be featured as title characters in their own series or become principal or major characters in the series in which they were introduced? Yeah, there was a character called Sabretooth that I co-created with Chris Claremont. He first appeared in Iron Fist. And he has gone on to become very significant in the X-Men. I believe he has had one miniseries, possibly more. While I was doing the X-Men, I created a Canadian superhero group called Alpha Flight, which is more than one character. That subsequently went on top of their own book. How long did the Alpha Flight title run? I think the original series ran something like 50 or 60 issues. I did it for 28. It was like 128 issues. <laughs> Do you have any financial interest in the success of any of the characters that you've created for Marvel over the years? To the extent that Marvel pays an incentive, I suppose I could be said to have a financial interest. When do you recall Marvel instituting an incentive payment policy for creators? I think it was around 1983. And could you just generally describe your understanding of the nature of that incentive program? The general incentive is a percentage of the cover price after a specific number of sales when it was originally introduced. I believe it was 4%, which was divided amongst the writer, the penciler, and the inker. In the case of Alpha Flight, I received an additional 1% creator's royalty. Do you have any ownership or proprietary interest in any of the characters or stories that you have written for Marvel? I don't believe I do, no. When did you first become acquainted with Mr. Wolfman, other than the brief meeting you described? It was, well, it... I would have met him in 1974, and subsequently on trips to New York and to the office, he would have been one of the people in the various groups that I would hang out with. Have you and Mr. Wolfman worked together on any comic book issues for publication by Marvel? Yes, we did the Fantastic Four together for a while. He was the writer and I was the penciler. I also did a Teen Titans. I think it was an annual or possibly some kind of special that he asked me to write, uh, to draw rather, and he was in the second seat when I was doing the reboot of Superman. I am placing before you Marvel Exhibit 41. Uh, did you work on this issue? Are there any characters that appeared uh, for the first time in this Fantastic Four issue 211 that you drew? Yes, the character of Terax, who appears on the cover, though I didn't draw the cover. And what input, what input, if any, did you get from Mr. Wolfman as the writer of this issue with respect to the character? What Mr. Wolfman told me at the time was that I believe in discussion with, I think he told me in discussion with Len Wein, he had realized that the Heralds of Galactus, Galactus being a major villain of the Fantastic Four, the Heralds of, of Galactus had developed quite unconsciously a theme of being based on the four elements. So we had the Silver Surfer, who was based on water. We had a character called the Air Walker, who was based on air, and a character called Fire Lord, who was based on fire. And Mr. Wolfman said he wanted to do a new Herald of Galactus who would be based on the fourth element, Earth. The idea being it would be a character who could manipulate the Earth, cause the Earth to do whatever he wanted to by the force of his will. Did Mr. Wolfman give you any physical description of the character uh, that would have this power? He said a big guy with an axe. Did he tell you anything else about the way the character would look? No. 
Who created the look of the Terax character in this issue? I did. Do you have an understanding as to whether, as a result of your creation of the look of Terax, you have an ownership interest in this character? Oh, no, I don't. Do you recall having any conversations with Mr. Wolfman uh, concerning who owned the rights to materials that freelance writers and artists submitted uh, to Marvel for publication in the 1970s? Mr. Diliberto says, objection calls to he calls for hearsay. The court says, overruled. I can remember several instances where I was in groups of people, which included Mr. Wolfman, that we are talking about various things and the idea of creator ownership and the discussions of some came up. And I remember three instances, and most particular in roughly chronological order. The first one would have been in 1975. I was in New York over the Thanksgiving weekend. Roger Stern, who is a writer and a friend of mine, had been invited to Thanksgiving dinner at Mr. Wolfman's house. And he brought me along as his date, quote unquote. And I was very new in the business, and I was just absolutely overawed to be sitting there having dinner with Mr. Wolfman and Len Wein and various other people. I asked a lot of questions about how the industry worked. And I was given the caution to be careful because the companies own everything you do. So be careful what you create. The second one would have been when, I believe it was when Mr. Wolfman and I were doing the Fantastic Four, he contacted me. He phoned me, said he had a science fiction series he was contemplating doing, possibly for submission to Star Reach, which was a small independent company. It was an apocalyptic sort of barbarians living in the shadowy streets of New York. Would I be interested in drawing it? He expressed to me this was sort of a partnership, that we would co-own this. It was very different from working at Marvel, because at Marvel, of course, you didn't own anything. The third, there's a little backstory to this, if you don't mind. I was at a convention in New York. We were all sitting around at a table at the convention talking about various things. It approached noon. The question of what to do about lunch came up. People said, we can get pizza. We can go to Brew Burger. We can get McDonald's. Somebody said... There's a little deli across the street. We can just go get a bagel. And I said, I never had a bagel. Mr. Wolfman and Mr. Ween were utterly astonished that I had never had a bagel. They practically physically transported me across the street to this deli and bought me my first bagel, which was an onion bagel with cream cheese. And it was one of these very chichi, very modern delis with the tall, skinny tables and stools. And the three of us sat at one of these tall, skinny tables and we talked about all kinds of stuff. One of the things that came up was Steve Gerber was engaged in, at that point, what I come to think of as an early saber rattling of whether he owned Howard the Duck. Len and Marv together expressed they were very interested about what Gerber was going to do about that, especially if he took it to trial, because how could he have a case since we all know the companies own everything? Did there come a time when you were hired by DC Comics to revamp the Superman character? Yes. How did you come to be hired by DC to do that? Subsequent to the release of the Superman movie with Christopher Reeve in 1978, I had been very vocal. I don't keep my opinions to myself. I had been very vocal about how I thought DC was mishandling Superman. And in 1985, for no particular reason, I decided to go off contract at Marvel. And Dick Giordano, who was the editor-in-chief, seemed to pick up that almost telepathically. It seemed almost at the moment I made the decision, he was on the phone calling me saying, Okay, we are going to revamp Superman. Mr. Giordano at the time was editor-in-chief of? DC. He said, okay, put your money where your mouth is. So I submitted what I called my list of unreasonable demands, which was about 20 things I wanted to do with Superman. Other people, such as Steve Gerber, Frank Miller, I believe Elliot Magan, had submitted their proposals. Mine was the one DC picked. They said that one of my demands was in fact unreasonable, but the rest of them they liked, and they said, okay, here's the contract. Was Mr. Wolfman involved to any extent in the revamping of the Superman character or the Superman hook? Not at first. What happened was DC wanted to do three Superman monthly titles. Superman, Action Comics, and a team-up book that was at that point untitled. A teacup where a, a team-up where Superman would team up with a different superhero every month. I immediately realized that doing three monthly Superman titles would cause me to burn out, no pun intended, to burn out in about a week and a half. <laughs> so it was agreed that someone else would obviously have to do one of the three books, and it was originally put forth that they would do Action Comics, the non-team-up book. Sometime after that, Andy Helfer, who was the editor, called me up and said he was thinking of offering the job to Mr. Wolfman. Did I have any objections? And I said no. I had worked with Marv in the past, and he has always been very friendly. That seemed fine. Shortly after that, Marv got in touch with me, and we agreed that we would take 
the second seat, that he would take the second seat. Did Mr. Wolfman make any suggestions to you with regard to the treatment of the Lex Luthor character? Yes, he had a, what would be a good way to describe it, a springboard idea for Luther. He called me, he said that he had been offered the second seat, he asked me if I had any thoughts on Luther. At that point, I hadn't started any physical work on the book at all. I said no, I was still kicking stuff around in my head with Krypton and Smallville and Metropolis and all that other stuff. He said he had got what he called a fix of Luther that he had in mind for a couple of years that he sort of just developed on his own and he wanted to tell it to me on two conditions. The first condition was that if indeed I liked his idea, we would use the entire idea precisely as he presented it to me or he wouldn't take the second seat. And if he didn't take the second seat, I had to promise that I would not use any part of his fix for Luther. That seemed perfectly reasonable to me, so I agreed to that. And he presented to me with sort of a little story. I remember exactly what he said. He said, quote, Outside Metropolis, there is a mountain. On the top of this mountain is his fabulous Xanadu-like estate lives Lex Luthor, the world's richest man and his mistress Lois Lane. You see, she is drawn to power, close quote. And I immediately said, no, that's not what I want to do with Lois. This is much more of a fix of Lois than it is of Luther. I guess we won't be working together. And Marv said, no, you don't have to use that part, which of course surprised me. And I said, okay. And I said, the part of Luther as the world's richest man. Let me see what I can do with that. Wolfman agreed to take the second seat and do the second title. No further questions. Thank you. Now we get into cross-examination of John Byrne by Mr. Michael Diliberto. See, it was Diliberto earlier. Now it's Dilberto. <clears throat> I can't see anything but Dilbert in this, that name. This stenographer, not very good. Sure. You know, tides, teacups. I'm not going to blame the stenographer. <laughs> this has probably been translated uh, more than once. You're very charitable. All right, here comes Mr. Dilberto. Just to pick up where you left off uh, about the Superman character, wasn't Marvel already writing Superman when you came on board at DC? He had written Superman prior to the reboot. Wasn't Mr. Wolfman's version of the reboot bought, bought out by DC? According to your associates, I was informed that Marv's version of Luther was bought out by DC. I have no other evidence of that. Weren't you forced to use this version that Marv Wolfman, Wolfman had created at DC? Forced? No. It was my choice. You say that the incentives came into effect at Marvel, did you say in 1983? I believe it was 83. Yet, you created Alpha Flight in, what was that, 1979? 1977, 78, 79, somewhere in that range. Didn't you specifically create that, that character on royalty incentives? No, it is not a character. It was a group of characters. Did you create that group to earn incentives? No, incentives didn't exist when I created the group. Just about your background. Did you graduate high school? I have a high school leaving diploma, which is something they give you up in Canada when they want to get rid of you. But you didn't graduate from high school, is that right? It qualifies as graduation. Technically, it isn't. Kayfabe conjecture? Explain that to us, uh, Canadians. Is it the same thing <laughs> as in America? Like, like, you get to go to school until you're 21, and if you fail enough times that you don't make it through 12th grade at 21... You're just out. You gotta, you gotta go make your way in the world. Is it that? Did John Byrne get held back? Is what I'm saying. Um, but you didn't graduate from high school. Is that right? It qualifies as graduation. Technically, it isn't. When Mr. Fleischer asked you about what characters, the iconic characters you worked on at Marvel or other places, you had mentioned Superman, Fantastic Four, or Spider Man. Yes. So it's fair to say that you are generally known as somebody who revamps the major iconic characters that have already been created by other creators. Some I revamp. Some I have merely worked on. I like playing with the old toys. In fact, in your opinion, a character is not a real character unless someone like Jack Kirby creates that character. No, that's not true. That's not what I said. I said that Alpha Flight were not real in my mind because they weren't created by Stanley and Jack Kirby. That was specific to Alpha Flight. But your preference is to work on pre-existing, major, iconic characters created by other persons other than yourself. It would depend on the circumstance. Would you rather work on Alpha Flight or the Jack Kirby character? Of those two, I would rather work on a Jack Kirby. It's fair to say that Jack Kirby characters are pre-existing, iconic characters? Yes, indeed. But if you said Devil Dinosaur or a character I created myself, I would say a character I created myself. 
Devil Dinosaur is a character created by Jack Kirby. You've earned over $10 million at Marvel? That's probably fair. If you had a chance that you would have to create your own character that wouldn't earn any money and a pre-existing iconic character for which you could earn $10 million over 20 years, would it be fair to say that you would rather work on a character or someone other, other than yourself? If we are doing it on money, the largest royalty I have ever received was for Alpha Flight. During your career, you earned $20 million from other than Alpha Flight. Right. I should point out, I did not earn $10 million specifically from Marvel. I would say $10 million probably in the course of my entire career. I have made 4 or $5 million doing the Next Men, which I created to own at Dark Horse. That's amazing. Those speculator boom 90s, man. You worked also... You got a couple of those bucks for me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, bought, me too. I bought all this next month. <laughs> I got to run. I got to run. I got about 15 issues. Uh, question. Uh, you worked also at DC on other existing, pre-existing iconic characters. Question mark. I like working on the iconic characters. If that is what you are going for, yes. We won't dispute that. Between Marvel and DC, you were working 20 million is a fair assessment. You said 10. 10 million over 20 years, question? 10 million over 20 years is probably fair. How much of that 10 million is Marvel? Five or six or seven million? Yes. Well, again, it would be hard to break it down. I made a lot of money doing Superman. That wasn't for Marvel. I probably made a couple million dollars doing Superman. Let's look at Marvel. Five or six or seven million? Five, maybe. Over the full 25 years of my career, I probably made five. As Mr. Fleischer asked you, uh, you are still working at Marvel right now? I am currently working at Marvel, yes. In fact, you have a new book you are working on right now, isn't that right, at Marvel? Yes. So you have projects in development right now at Marvel? It's beyond development. I have done two issues. Do you remember at your deposition that Mr. A, we'll call him, uh, conducted, uh, there was discussion about the character Alpha Flight? Characters Alpha Flight. It's a group. <laughs> you were asked if you owned the character Alpha Flight. You didn't see the distinction at your deposition, but the question was, do you own that character Alpha Flight? Holy fuck. I don't recall your associate referring to Alpha Flight as a character. If I heard him say character, I would have corrected him. It's at least eight characters. Allow me to read from your deposition then. The question was, do you have any ownership interest in the Alpha Flight? Answer, no. Then you referred to an interview that you gave. May I point out he did not say character. He merely said the title. There was a reference to the comics interview number 25, and the question was, you created Alpha Flight and the X-Men, but if you were to create new characters, would you want to own them? And your answer, well, I partially own Alpha Flight. Yes, that was my understanding at the time I gave that interview. When was that? I believe that was 1985. During your deposition in 1999, you said you weren't sure if you owned rights to the Alpha Flight. Yes, we have an unfortunate tendency in the comic book industry to bandy around terms that we don't really use correctly. Creator is one of them. In that case, I was using ownership incorrectly. I was interpreting the 1% creator's incentive that I was being paid as representing some kind of ownership. Subsequently, I have come to realize that that was not the case. In 1985, I was confused. Let me ask you this, a yes or no answer. In 1985, you were unsure if you owned rights to Alpha Flight. But after being asked to be a witness in the proceeding in 1999, now you know you don't own rights in Alpha Flight. Is that a fair statement? No. Why not? Because I did not come to that conclusion as a result of being asked to testify in this hearing, which is the way you phrased the question. I came to that conclusion quite a long time ago. At your deposition, it was asked, quote, Is it your understanding that if you were, go were going to create a new character, uh, would you be entitled to receive money for merchandising such as toys? End quote. Page 23, line 5. Quote, At the time uh, when that interview was given, the explosion of comic characters released for toys was just starting out. We had no real sense of where it was going to go or what form it was going to take. That was my understanding. Was the concept of comic characters being released for toys a new concept? No, but it was beginning to be exploited more than for a few years, especially for toys. What period of time was that exploitation beginning? I would say that what we think of now as action figures were really just starting to appear around 1985, 1984, somewhere in that range. I wasn't paying that much attention to the toy market in those days. 
What about use of characters for, say, motion pictures or television? There hadn't been very much of that at all. The Superman movies, a couple of Marvel movies on TV that had not been very successful. What was the first use of characters for film, to your knowledge? My goodness, I wonder. That would probably go back to the serials of the 1930s, 30s and 40s, possibly. So as early as the 1930s, comic book companies have been utilizing comic book characters for film? Yes. To the present day, is that a fair statement? Off and on, yes. There were huge droughts where nothing happened. Were comic book companies using characters for television in the 30s or after? Not in the 1930s, no. The first time I saw a comic book character on television would have been Superman, which had been for me in 1956. Now, I know most people are passionate about this industry. I take it as a kid you were a big fan of the Fantastic Four? Absolutely. You bought your first issue of Fantastic Four in 1962? Yes. That was the first Marvel comic you ever bought, right? Yes. Not the first one I read, but the first one I bought. Mr. Fleischer asked you uh, about that, s that spec you wrote about Fantastic Four. The purpose was to obtain regular employment at Marvel in the Fantastic Four series? To obtain regular employment at Marvel, but not on the Fantastic Four. The Fantastic Four was Marvel's flagship title. I did not expect to walk in as a neophyte, a new person in the industry, and be handed the flagship book. In your deposition, you stated that you thought Mr. Wolfman was the editor-in-chief at the time uh, of the submission at Marvel. As I said earlier, I allowed your associate to lead me on that. If I had taken a moment to think, I would have realized that since it took place in 1984, Marv Wolfman could not possibly have been editor-in-chief. And of course, it's 1974. Question. 1974, excuse me. I am trying not to be as old as I am. <laughs> and then in... Uh... After the question of when you answered yes to, did Mr. Wolfman turn down your submission? The next question was at the same page, uh, did you like that? Is that an accurate statement? One doesn't. We don't dispute that. Now, I believe you testified at trial uh, just now that there were three occasions when Mr. Wolfman told you that Marvel owns everything. Three that I remember that were addressed more or less directly to me. But at your deposition, you said you could only recall one clearly. At that point, I could only recall one. Obviously, I haven't spent a great deal of time prior to the deposition reviewing the effects or the events. I had no idea what I was going to be asked at the deposition. Have they discussed your testimony for today? We have discussed testimony. Did that discussion refresh your memory uh, that there were three occasions? No. Actually, it was not discussion with the lawyers that refreshed my memory. It was fellow professionals, specifically Roger Stern. Are any of those professionals sitting in the courtroom as witnesses for Marvel as well? No. Since your deposition, have you changed your testimony on that issue? Now, when these alleged statements were made by Mr. Wolfman that Marvel owns everything, you weren't working with Mr. Wolfman at that time. Isn't that right? No, I wasn't working with Marv. So this statement would have occurred in the context of him being a Marvel representative or any working relationship that you might have had with Mr. Wolfman at that time. Isn't that right? No, no. It was not a working relationship. No, it was merely, you know, people talking to people. And you never saw a check that Mr. Wolfman signed with any legend on the back of it uh, allegedly giving rights to Marvel. Isn't that right? I've never seen a check that Marv has signed. No, he has probably never seen a check I signed. Today, as you sit here, do you have any ownership interest in Alpha Flight? No, not in the way the term is being used here. Well, how is the term being used here? In the sense that I could take those characters somewhere else if I wanted to. What ownership do you have aside from that aspect of ownership interest in Alpha Flight? Only in the sense that I would be paid a creator's percentage if the book was to be published again and exceed a certain sales number, which really probably does not qualify as ownership. So you have an ownership interest in royalties then, is that right? You are really talking in legal terms that I don't understand. The best I can say is, if Marvel was to do an Alpha Flight series that sold in excess of 100,000 copies, I would say a 1% creator's ro I would see a 1% creator's royalty on those sales. Well then, follow that train of thought. If Alpha Flight uh, were used for motion pictures, would you receive a royalty? Isn't that correct? Yes. Now, you stated that you remember seeing legends on backs of checks that you received at Marvel, and your quote when Mr. Fleischer asked you what the legend was, you said, everything I do for the company, the company owns. Yes. Was that the actual legend? Of course not. He asked me what my understanding of it was. He didn't ask me to quote it. I couldn't quote the legend. 
you were shown Marvel Exhibit 1, the vouchers. Uh, when did you first see these vouchers? Let's see. The voucher has changed a couple of times, so I couldn't swear to exactly when I saw that particular form. So you have no knowledge as to when Marvel used this particular voucher? Well, I noticed that one is dated 1991. That sounds about right. This particular voucher would not have been in existence prior to 1991. Is that right? It may have been in existence in 1971, for all I know. I don't remember the exact form. Uh, you don't know when this Exhibit 1 was used at Marvel? I don't know when that particular form of the voucher began to be used, if you're referring to the front. No. To be honest, I would have to say I cannot give a specific date of when that started. Then I believe you testified earlier that even uh, this form has changed over the years at Marvel. Yes, the vouchers did not used to have a legend on the back because the legend was on the checks. So there was a time when there was no legend on a voucher. On the voucher, because it was on the checks. You have referred to yourself as a cog in the machine at Marvel? I have indeed. And you would probably call yourself a company man? Yes, I have no problem with that. I believe corporate loyalty is a good thing. You are loyal to the company that you work for. And you are loyal to Marvel, of course, isn't that right? When I am working for Marvel, I am loyal to Marvel, I suppose, yes. And you are working for Marvel right now, aren't you? I am indeed. No further questions, Your Honor. John Burns' redirect examination, Mr. Fleischer comes into the game again. Would your notion of loyalty, Mr. Byrne, uh, cause you to testify falsely? No. There is a difference between loyalty and ethics. The arrangement you had for incentive payments on Alpha Flight arise pursuant uh, to what kind of an arrangement? If I am understanding the question, when Alpha Flight got its own book, when they became their own title after having appeared in the X-Men, Jim Shooter, who was editor-in-chief at Marvel at the time, suggested that I create a few new characters. And I created two new members of Alpha Flight and two secondary teams, Beta and Gamma Flights, so that I could be assured creator ownership under the New Deal. So when you originally created Alpha Flight characters that were part of that team, uh, if you will, the incentive policy at Marvel didn't exist. Is that right? No. Then when the policy came into effect, uh, you created new characters in Alpha Flight. Yes. And the policy, therefore, applied to those characters? Yes. No further questions, Your Honor. Interesting line of questioning. Uh, Contentious. It's, yeah. It feels like any of these interactions with lawyers, they're, they're, it's such pushing and prodding. Yeah. Like it feels like they all end up in this tone of everyone's disgusted. Yes. I, I don't know who the heels and baby faces are. <laughs> because, you know, in my mind, it's like Neil Gaiman won the case with McFarlane. He's the, he's the baby face. McFarlane's the heel. Which doesn't actually add up in real life or make sense here, but it feels like they all have an antagonistic relationship with whoever is asking these questions. And I don't feel... At this point, it seems like a pattern. Yeah. Like, that is by design. Yeah, it's like technique. Yes. Technique, man. Get a guy a little frazzled. Get them... You can't handle the truth. You need me on that wall. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's, that's, that's what I'm starting to see. <laughs> you need me on that wall. And believe it or not, the comic book creators that we've been reading uh, testimonies from, a little bit less... Uh, demonstrative than than jack nicholson <laughs> did you order the code red <laughs> the the cog in the wheel is like one of the famous bits mm -hmm. uh about the john byrne stuff man that uh where did that come up was it like a comic convention or something where where uh where he first mentioned that idea of being it, it makes me wonder because i'm a little disappointed in the amount of cog in the wheel talk in this deposition i right. thought this is where it, it was but uh because that's in quotes you know, he's referred to himself as that somewhere else. And I don't yeah. know where, but it does make me curious. Yeah, yeah. Super fascinating. So we need to get into this Marv Wolfman piece a bit, man, because it has some good comic history in, in it. I, I love that we have a little bit of context about that Fantastic Four spec amount of pages that uh, we showed off in that previous video. And to just imagine John Byrne, like, coming down from Canada to New York with very specific intent to try to get work. Those are good pages, man. They like, are. Yeah, you... you you believe in yourself enough, like, you bring those pages to a convention, you're, you're getting a job, you know? You're going to get yeah. something. And, and not just, like, three pages of samples. Like, that was, like, a book. Absolutely. It might have even been longer than a standard book. He said to hear a full issue. And, and, like, there's always that, like, um, persecution complex that you get a lot in comics, man. Uh, so we have his little bit with Rich Buckler. Like, oh, I showed him this comic, and I said, I want your job. So he, he torpedoed everything <laughs> because, like... He's under the delusion that, like, you show these pages, like, if Brian Bolin came in and showed off some pages 
And whoever's drawing Fantastic Four is like, don't give him a job. Yeah, right. Or else I'm done with you. You think there's going to be editorial loyalty to you just because you have some kind of seniority? You're out, man. We're getting this fresh guy in. Not only that, do you want to work for this company that looks at these pages and goes, Brian Boland, these pages are great, but this guy says no. Right. <laughs> like, what is going on here? What yeah. is this business? Yeah, that's such silly talk. But but John Byrne has to get a little venom in. It is... Uh, he's a character. He's, yeah. a, he's, a, he's a very legendary character, and I've had personal run-ins with John Byrne that I can affirm he's a character. You, said it, it, you said it on previous episodes. Tell, it comes tell, through. Tell the people. Sure. So uh, when I'm 16, I make my first mini-comic. Next Men is my favorite comic at the time. And I go to Mid Ohio Con, drive to Mid Ohio Con 16, I drive myself there to give him basically my mini comic. And he kind of like, you know, touches it and is like, you know, I'm just going to throw this in the garbage, so you might as well keep it. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't care for that. Uh, but in hindsight, I look at it and go, at least the guy's honest. Yeah. Because he's flying, traveling, whatever, you know, I get it. You know, having been on both sides of the table, I understand that now. But I uh, was pretty upset by it at the time. Didn't care for it. Again, I understand it. But, uh, you know, I do think his character parts do come through uh, in this interview, you know, loud and clear. And he was a guy I followed around, you know, like I would read interviews and stuff with him pretty into his work. And I feel like this is uh, pretty in line with the stuff that I was reading because it would have been in the 90s that I was uh, a fan of his and reading interviews and trying to put that stuff together. I think it's really great. Um I like the part about him getting a job with Charlton at this convention using these samples. And this is 1974 when he's got these samples he's showing around, like mid-74, I think. And uh, by 75, he's, he's found his way to Marvel, you know, through work at Charlton and just perseverance and, and uh, being a very talented comic book artist. He did a lot at Charlton. Like, I, I have maybe 10 issues of that Doomsday Squad that was also reprinted by uh, Fantagraphics much later. Um, with like interesting backups, like you saw Guido Jimbo mm -hmm. backups and Lloyd Llewellyn backups, and he did a kind of like a Hot Wheels Wacky Racers type comic for Charlton. Bill got it into Copacetic one day when I was there. He's like, "You know what this is?" I'm like, "I don't know what that is." He's like, "This is John Byrne's first published comic." Wow, yeah, some I didn't kind know of that. like race car comic. I was talking with Bill, like we might have to get him to come over here, bring stuff like that, the studio book. Bring stuff like some of that Gore, Bli Gore Blimey Press yeah. portfolio books and like just that shit that we will never get our hands on. He's got it, right? You know, so we we need to see that. So we need to see the John Byrne Wacky Racers Hot Wheels. I'd be comic. curious to take a look at that. Yeah, man. So uh, this is not the last courtroom testimony we have to cover. We still have Michael Fleischer stuff, Gary Groth depositions, Harlan Ellison depositions, Dean Mullaney depositions in regards to Fleischer versus Fantagraphics. We need to get our hands on more issues of this exact comic. Like, uh, you know, we could sit here all close together and read this thing with our heads close together, but uh, that just is inefficient. We need issues of uh, Comics General 236 and 239, which wrap this thing up. We get, a, we get our hands on these, man. We're going to really go deep on this Marv Wolfman testimony, which is going to take 10 episodes, maybe. Yeah, and you know, probably very worthwhile. This is a guy who was editor-in-chief at Marvel. You're going to, I'm sure, get into comics history. Yes. Um, you know, they talk about in the Burn uh, interview how their vouchers and legends changed over time. So, you know, you get a guy like Marv Wolfman, I'm sure that's coming up. Like, you're going to get kind of the history of Marvel's policy on these things these things and he's and he was working in administration as editor in chief and as creative you know it's getting into his warren uh career like what the what the copyright policies were there uh a big part of his case hinges on the fact that he did not sign explicit stuff saying that this character is yours i just signed these vouchers right. for ten dollars per page I would not sell my baby to you for $10 per page. That would be preposterous. He basically uses those words here. Somebody might want to post some information on copyright laws because I feel like there was a change in copyright laws, a big one in the late 70s, I yeah. want to say, and, and possibly that affects you know what Wolfman's angle is, why he believes you know he has rights to this character and whatnot. Um, I think that was something that affected Kirby and, and various creators, you know, like... Because these laws change over time. So yeah. whenever you create those characters, that affects which laws apply. When we grew up, we just automatically assumed that you do stuff for Marvel, they own it all. And 
it feels like there's more to it. Like, Wolfman's working some kind of angle. Like, this is something he has to do. Like, there's that whole thing that happened, you know, here in town where those guys painted that Ninja Turtles on the facade of this video store, sent it off to Eastman and Laird, sent it off to Mirage Studios. Like, hey, cool, look at this thing that we painted. And they got feedback from Mirage. I was like, ah, oh, I wish you wouldn't have sent that right. to us. Because you have to uh, enforce your trademarks. You do, or else you forfeit it. Yeah, uh, Steve Bissett's talked to me about this. Yeah. Um, you know, a guy who, who's a big advocate for creator rights and ownership and stuff. So it's it's you'd think it would all be uh, well-known knowledge in comics because it pertains to what we all do. And yet, I think I pay closer attention than your average comic book artist and i can't i can't tell you the intricacies of any of this yeah and it comes off fairly often man like uh the gary friedrich stuff with with ghost rider that... i bet you that overlaps a lot with wolfman because i think ghost rider and blade would have been maybe a similar time frame when those characters were created yeah and uh even the lawsuits i think might might be close within a decade I well think. within a decade sure because i mean we we were together traveling at conventions when gary friedrich is going there and billing himself you know creator of, of ghost rider and i think he's like prevented from doing that part at this point i think i think he had to like pawn some stuff man to like pay his legal shit after. yeah that's a that's a dark case yeah uh, for sure and you know Go read about it if you're not familiar with it at home. Whenever I say that, there's some. It's that's a sad story. Um, the other thing that I find in this particular testimony is the idea of creator and creation. You know, like what did you create, and how like these terms are used differently or defined. You know, legally in this case, maybe a little bit different than the what we think of as like a dictionary definition of create. I find that really interesting because that gets into kayfabe stuff where it's like we've got our own vocabulary yeah. within this industry. Part of the reason that it is a little bit confusing as to like what what rights do you have? And, you know, you see it as they're going through the alpha flight stuff and really defining like well, that's creator incentive one percent or whatever, you know, and it's like, yeah, but it's not creator ownership. <laughs> right. You know, like it's funny. I bet you that term has evolved quite a bit over the last several decades as to like who's called creator of what, what does creator mean in Marvel comics and DC comics and Disney and all of these companies. And he uses that word, John Byrne, very specifically incentive. And that's what they call it. They mm -hmm. do not call it royalties because the implication is they don't have to do this. Well, I mean, royalty used to have a significant legal definition that was important to the IRS. You know, like that was classified differently as, you know, different type of income, which yeah. I think that has changed uh, in, since we've been working. And not not in a good favor. It's no, still income. Not. It sucks. I, you, I don't know if it, we don't get it's not like capital changed, gains uh, in, in, a, in a good way for the little for the for the worker. But uh, I'm just saying, like, all of these terms do mean something. They mean something in terms of what we understand. And then they mean something in terms of how are they defined legally? Right. Wow. Yeah, it's uh, it's it's this is fun. I I, I appreciate that Burns' personality comes through in this too. <laughs> yeah, it's, it makes for entertaining reading. He would have got burned out. No, I pun bet intended. I bet he was a lot harder in some of those answers to the lawyer than I was. <laughs> uh, that like not burned out thing. That's great. Isn't that like uh, <laughs> Vincent Price as uh, Egghead in Batman by saying words like? exuberant yes <laughs> exactly that's great i don't I need to get burned swear out that uh he called his fans burn victims right like, like in in uh, next men in the letters column and stuff yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's i love it uh fantastic man not the last courtroom dramas we're gonna cover man and we'll be back here next week maybe even with some of that will eisner some of uh, some golden age court cases yeah man talk about like getting into creator ownership and rights like that's some of the early stuff for comics history. For sure, man. Uh, in the meantime, Kfabers like, follow, subscribe to the YouTube channel, hit the bell, we'll notify you when new vids are available. What's out there, Jim? Hulk Grand Design, coming to your local comic book store in March. Tell your local comic book store to pre-order that for you, to save it, to put it in your pool box, your subscriber box, however your, your system works at your comic shop. Tell them you want Hulk Grand Design. Four great covers to choose from. I highly recommend all four. Get the set, why not? And uh, join me on patreon.com slash jimrug where you can see some of my original art process scripts, how I make the comics I make, including Hulk Grand Design. Red Room Trigger Warnings is coming out in March as well. It's a kayfabe month in uh, March and April of 2022. Red Room Trigger Warnings issue number one is going to be coming out on a monthly basis for issues of this season's worth of uh, Red Room Comics, Murder on the Dark Web for Fun and Profit. 
is the tagline to go along with uh, with Red Room, and every issue is completely self-contained. You can read these comics today on my Patreon for three bucks. You get the complete archive there, more than 200 pages worth of comics. Uh, at my link trees in the description below this video, you could get to pre-order the comics, order the existing comics, or hit up the Patreon. What else do we have? Subscribe to the Cartoonist Kayfabe e-newsletter at the links below the video. You can also find Cartoonist Kayfabe t-shirts and merchandise at the links below the video. That's another great way to support the Cartoonist Kayfabe YouTube channel. Jimmy, given the merchandise orders, we'll be on our way. Read more comics. And stay out of court. <laughs>